Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the turquoiseation of Taiwan society. Turquoiseation, what's that? Well, um, Taiwan society typically is uh, thought to be divided between the blue and the green. The blue represents the forces of the Nationalist Party, and the green represents the forces of the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP. And because of that, Taiwan has experienced um, an undue amount of uh, polarization uh, in recent years. So I have a number of slides that I'm going to use throughout today. And uh, let's go on. Uh, here's my title, my fancy academic title, Division, Polarization, and Reconciliation Towards the Turquoiseation of Taiwan. That's, next slide, please. Well, this topic is important to me because I think that Taiwan is a highly successful society. Uh, although it's often overshadowed by China. It's successful in that it was authoritarian, but now it's robustly democratic. It was poor, but now the economy is strong. Next. Next, please. So first of all, I'd like to talk about division versus polarization. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this division part because of our time constraints. Uh, next, please. Um, the, the historic divisions in Taiwan society, they're sort of hard to uh, erase because they're so deeply seated. Next. Uh, if we look at Taiwan geographically, we see there's huge divisions between each geographic region, that is the north, the south, the central part of uh, Taiwan, and also the offshore islands. Next. And right down the middle of Taiwan, you see the central mountain range, which divides Taiwan uh, into east and west, and both sides of Taiwan have a distinctly different character. Next. Taiwan's history is a history of colonization and immigration. Here I've outlined for you the different waves of colonization that started off with the Dutch in 1624, and it runs right through to the Nationalist Party that came to Taiwan in 1945. Many people in Taiwan, native uh, Taiwan, uh, is um, I see that as just another colonial government. Next. And then there's the ethnic division between the Taiwanese of the Hokan, the Hakka, the mainlanders. Uh, and I would have to say it's unfortunate, but over the years there's been a lot of discrimination by mainlanders towards Taiwanese. And then there's the aboriginal component of society uh, divided into different uh, tribes. Uh, and then again, ge um, somewhat geographically divided between the mountain aborigines and the plains people. Next. So what's the solution to all of this historic division? I'm afraid there's no real good one. Time and new policies. Now let's move on to polarization. Next, please. Uh, polarization is a more contemporary phenomenon in Taiwan. And what do we mean by polarization? government's inability to address relevant problems confronting society. Um, the, the manifestation of a low level of public trust, institutional lack of reform, lack of transparency. But then again, it's important to remember that like South Korea, Taiwan is a young democracy. And for young democracies and even ones as mature as the United States, uh, change doesn't come easily. Um, and moreover, as we said, there is this contention between the blue and the green forces of Taiwan society. And further beyond that is this uh, tussle, um, conflict between Taiwanese identity versus China policy. Uh, that means those people who increasingly see those themselves as being people of Taiwan and not wanting very much to do with China versus other people especially represented by the Nationalist Party, who want a very close relationship with China. Um, I think we can have the next slide at this point. Uh, polarization also goes on to, uh, is maybe clearly um, illustrated in this quote I have from a well-known uh, Nationalist Party politician. Uh, we eat Chinese food, we speak Chinese, we are Taiwanese. I think that shows that there's this growing sense of Taiwaneseness in Taiwan uh, that contributes to the polarization, especially for those people who hold that um, 
uh, a deep Chinese sense of identity. Um, the more that China pushes on Taiwan, the deeper this sense of Taiwanese identity becomes. Well, this manifests itself politically in what's called the 92 consensus. The 90 consensus um, was a, a, a somewhat of an agreement at saying that there's only one China. Uh, and this is the agreement between mainland and Taiwan. But just defining exactly who that China is or what that China is is the difficulty. Actually, Taiwanese identity has a very long history. It goes back to the days of Japanese rule. Japan ruled Taiwan as a colony from 1895 to 1945. And I said at this time that you really begin to see Taiwan's sense of identity begin to, to firm up. Um, when the nationals came to Taiwan in 1945, they tried to suppress that Taiwanese identity. And then um, they weren't very successful. Um, uh, because, uh, as you can see, in 1979, there was the Mei Li Dao incident, or sometimes known as the Kaohsiung incident, which really brought this Taiwanese identity issue and sensitivity to the surface again. Next, please. Well, the start of the really acute polarization started with the rule of Chen Shui-bian, who was the president of Taiwan from 2000 to 2008, especially after his re-election uh, in, um, and actually it should be 2004, um, this became particularly acute. Uh, during her recent uh, electoral, electoral campaign, Tsai Ing-wen, the current president of Taiwan, listed uh, in her campaign brochures the resolution or the uh, getting rid of the elimination of polarization. But it's quite un not very clear just what her method is for doing that. She talks a lot about a Taiwan consensus, uh, and this is a concept I'll come back with, uh, to later as a possible solution, but it, it lacks definition. All in all, uh, while some people say that Taiwan is a highly polarized society, I think the polarization is mainly amongst the um, political elites, that is, people who hold political positions, people who are very concerned about politics, people who regularly um, participate in demonstrations, um, those kinds of folks. In all, I would say the polarization in Taiwan is not acute. It's um, mildly polarized. Next, please. But there are other factors driving polarization. So let's so let's talk about some of those. Next, globalization. Globalization has really contributed to. Um, should we say an economic division in Taiwan? You might say between the haves and have-nots. As the uh, inter as international uh, economic competition becomes more and more competitive, uh, Taiwan seeks to come up with uh, has yet to come up with a new model of economic development. It's overly reliant on contract manufacturing, as is best exemplified um, by the Honhai or Foxconn Corporation. And this contract model of contract manufacturing depends on cheap labor. Taiwan has never been able to wean itself off of cheap labor. And when labor in Taiwan became too expensive, it simply moved those industries to areas like China where labor was cheap. In fact, this resulted in a hollowing out of Taiwan's economy with $200 billion, U.S. dollars, that is, being invested in the mainland. Uh, so this transition from manufacturing to service industry is very, very slow. Uh, because it's so slow, uh, it has failed to create needed jobs, and it has failed to create jobs that pay well. Next, please. Um, this has resulted in what's called uh, the M Society, which is a clear illustration of the inequality of wealth. The uh, rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, and the, the sagging middle class right in the middle, the V of the M, becoming poorer and poorer. Uh, this is also precipitated by uh, soaring house prices and the fact, as I just mentioned, that wages have not really increased since 2001. And for the poorer, um, 
folks in Taiwan, the poorest 30 percent, the wages are uh, lower th uh, than they were in 1999. What's the solution? Some would say redistributive policies, tax credits for lower income people, programs to make housing more affordable, um, and uh, to hold on uh, to a capital gains tax. That is, Taiwan has a capital gains tax, but it's very haphazardly administered. And I see a, a typo there. Uh, housing more avoidable should be affordable. Next, please. And then there's the demographic challenge. This is um, the young, it divides the young and pits them against the old. That is, the young are being asked to bear so much of the responsibility for social cost, et cetera, to provide for the elderly. Um, but the truth of the matter is, unless they're good jobs that are high paying, it's very difficult for them to do. A lot of young people feel the stress of the situation. Next. And because of that, uh, many of them joined in 2014 the Sunflower Movement, which was um, uh, a huge, very well-organized protest, protesting the economic um, situation in Taiwan and also its over-reliance on, uh, on China. Next. Um, interestingly enough, though, the government has responded um, by lowering the voting age. And just a few weeks ago, the, lowering, the voting age was lowered uh, to uh, 18 from 21. This creates, um, however, there is a, a deficiency here in that Taiwan still lacks a credible uh, absentee voting system. And for this, I blame both of the major parties. Both of the major parties are fearful of enacting an absentee voting system, such as the Japanese have, such as the Koreans have, such as the Filipinos have, such as many European countries have, for fear they would help their, their opponents. Next. And then there's the dimensions of Taiwan's political culture. Basically, it, again, it's important to remember that Taiwan is a, uh, a very young democracy. It's kind of feeling its way along. Um, it's unfortunate that the political culture there has lent itself to a zero-sum decision-making environment. Um, there is no, there's very little sense of win-win solutions. And in addition, Taiwan is a society that's very given to mass mobilization. And one might also say, in some ways, I think the Taiwan electorate is a little bit spoiled. Um, they elect someone to office and expect um, instantaneous results, results to very complex, complicated problems that have been festering for quite a long period of time, and expect all, this, uh, all these problems to be uh, solved in a few months. One can see this in polling uh, information, polling data. Somebody gets elected to the president of Taiwan, just as is the case in South Korea and Japan. I think there's a pan-Asian phenomena here. And they have a very high approval rating. Two months later, three months later, their poll ratings um, have um, dipped quite a bit. Next. And then there's the referendum law. This is a really controversial issue in, um, in Taiwan. Um, Taiwan, because it is a democracy, it does have referendum. But the referendum standards were really quite high. And it was very difficult, if not impossible, to really launch a successful referendum. So just recently, the Taiwan government lowered the standard needed for referendum. In other words, the number of people that need to go to the polls to support it. And I can tell you, after having been in uh, China for the last four months and uh, spent a lot of time talking to China's uh, Taiwan experts, they're very worried about how this referendum might manifest itself. Will uh, Taiwan or certain politicians in Taiwan use it to uh, try to affect some sort of a de jure Taiwan, uh, a Taiwan that is um, legitimately and completely um, independent as opposed to Taiwan's current status, which is a de facto independence. And this might very well be the case, because here you see two pictures of two leading proponents of Taiwan independence. On the left is former President Chen Shui-bian, and on the right is former President Li Donghui, 
who are both very strong advocates of Taiwan independence and have vowed to use this new liberalized referendum law um, to push forward uh, Taiwan independence. Issues like this concern both China and Washington. Next. The need for constitutional reform, another hot burning issue in Taiwan. Um, and even some mainland scholars that I talked to um, believe that Taiwan needs, needs constitutional reform, in that Taiwan's constitution was created in 1946 in China as an instrument to govern China, uh, not an instrument to govern Taiwan. And yes, there have been some amendments, but still, it's very wobbly, and it's not efficient, and um, there is a certain lack of accountability in both the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the government. And also a needed, another way of saying that is an added need for transparency. Next. <clears throat> Taiwan's legislature um, is, um, from an American point of view, lacking. It's too small. It gives too much, um, um, how should we say, weight to majoritarian um, uh, decisions. There's little room for a minority point of view. Uh, something more proportional needs to be created. There's issues about the way the districts are drawn, uh, favoring one party rather than another. Um, a friend of mine, Nathan Bato, who's a researcher at the Institute of uh, Political Science at Academia Sinica, a huge uh, think tank, the number one think tank in Taiwan, believes there needs to be uh, midterm elections to increase accountability and to make all entities more responsive to the uh, public will. Moreover, uh, the legislature has, in my view, some deficiencies in that it's uh, investigative powers are lacking, and it needs its own budget. Next. Well, the Taiwan legislature is known to be a den of a free-for-all, and oftentimes fisticuffs broke out, uh, break out on the floor of the legislature, <coughs> the Li Fa Yuan. And here you can see a picture of such action. Uh, uh, lots of mainland specialists, uh, Taiwan specialists, think this is laughable. But then again, next slide. If I look at the National People's Congress, uh, which uh, just uh, uh, met in uh, Beijing, this is, to me, this is the joke. This is where you have 3,000 representatives who all raise their hand at the same time approving whatever motion has been introduced. Clearly, and many Chinese will tell you this, it's a rubber stamp. Pi Xiang Tu Jiang. Next, please. Another matter of great controversy and also of uh, a polarizing uh, fact that, uh, that contributes to a polarization is the uh, structure of the Taiwan government. Should it be semi-presidential, as it is now, or should it be changed to a parliamentary system? Semi the problem with the semi-presidential system uh, that people say is you can have a legislature controlled by an opposition party and the presidency controlled by uh, a member of the opposite party. And this leads to confrontation. This leads to polarization. One could see this very clearly when Chen Shui-bian was president. Uh, he, of course, was of the DPP, yet the legislature, the Li Fa Yuan, was controlled by the KMT. Well, other people say that to eliminate the possibility of this happening in the future, Taiwan should change itself to a parliamentary system. And a parliamentary system would be somewhat like Britain or Japan, where if your party controls the majority of seats in the legislature, then your party gets to pick the prime minister. And this would, uh, and some people's views, especially Mayor, uh, Jews' uh, view, um, this would be ideally suited to a young democracy, which is a developed country but has uh, lots of development goals it's still striving to achieve. On the other hand, Premier Lai, a former mayor of Tainan, is a strong uh, proponent of the pres semi-presidential system. 
saying that this system offers a system of checks and balances to ensure that no one part of the government becomes too powerful. Next. And then there's the issue of judicial reform. Um, sometimes I think that the judiciary in Taiwan is not as bad as some people say it is. There is the characterization that it's um, um, staffed by those that are old dragons, old dragons of the KMT, the judges and others that have been put into positions of influence uh, during the heyday of the Nationalist Party. Yet again, I think about major um, legal decisions that involving the KMT that have gone against the wishes of the KMT. So I'm not so sure that um, the judiciary in Taiwan is as stacked with old dragons as some would say. Nevertheless, uh, there is a huge concern about the efficiency of the system. Again, uh, a lack of transparency. There is also some proposals to in introduce a Western-style ju um, jury system. Uh, I, I've talked to some um, uh, um, figures in the um, judicial yuan, the part of the Chinese government that um, attends to just judicial issues. And the folks I talked to were uh, very much involved in working on judicial reform. One of the key concerns was um, um, bringing up to date the criminal code. And it's unfortunate, but a lot of the criminal code still holds laws um, that were copied from Nazi Germany um, in the 30s and early 40s and uh, incorporated into, Thai, uh, into then China criminal law. And later, this body of laws was transferred to Taiwan. Uh, so there is a need to get rid of those, no doubt. Next, please. Pension reform. This is one of the huge, huge polarizing issues of um, Taiwan as we speak today. Um, I give the Tsai Ing-wen credit for attacking pension reform because it's something that certainly needed to be done. And if it were not done, then the pension system would go broke in a very short period of time. So she really took the bull by the horns, and I think maybe there's a good lesson here for the U.S. Congress as it um, sort of kicks the can of Social Security reform down the road. And uh, she took it on, uh, and uh, it's been very unpopular. Uh, those who had pensions already are losing a certain portion of them. People who will qualify for pensions in the future will not get as much as they thought. Um, this really, in some people's view, hits at the basis of Taiwan's political stability, which traditionally has been based on the military, government officials, and teachers. But again, if she didn't do anything about it, um, this fund, the pension, uh, pension fund, would go broke in a very short period of time, and that certainly would be um, destabilizing. Next, please. And then again, there's the labor standards reform. The Democratic Progressive Party, President Tsai Ing-wen's party, is a party that's supposed to represent the interests of the working people. And often the complaint has been that Tsai, people in Taiwan work too hard and they suffer from fatigue. So she sought to standardize um, uh, labor rules and labor laws. And while this sounds all well and good, uh, it's really hard to come up with a solution that satisfies everybody. Employers, employees, employers. Yes, some employees want a sta standardized, um, standardized laws governing how many hours they can work and how much they should be paid for overtime and how much overtime they should be paid, etc. Yet others want to work as much as they can and get paid as much overtime as they can. And then again, employers are not too enthusiastic about paying uh, overtime and um, would prefer, I suppose, to have employees work additional time but at a standard rate, if that. Next. Transitional justice, another huge, huge uh, contentious issue. Um, Taiwan went through the period of the White Terror. This is the, also uh, might be thought of as the period of martial law. 
Uh, martial law was instituted in, I believe it was 1947, and ended in 1988. During that period of time, um, there were a lot of um, injustices carried out. There were a lot of uh, symbols, uh, authoritarian symbols, uh, exalting Chiang Kai-shek, uh, built throughout the island. There was a lot of um, judicial wrongdoings. There was, there's still a lots of political archives that have, um, that deal with this period of time that have yet to be dealt with. So, uh, and then there's the aboriginal land issue, uh, very similar to the land issues um, that the Hawaiian community in Hawaii faces. Next, please. And here you can see what I think is a great example for the U.S. This is a... Um, I, shall, I shall call it a dumping ground for statues of Chiang Kai-shek that have been removed from wherever they were in whatever city of Taiwan and put into one place. I think we should follow this example for some of those statues of Confederate generals and leaders of the Confederacy uh, as those statues come down throughout the South. Next. And then another issue. Um, the issues confronting Taiwan are many. Uh, the deals with the KMT Nationalist Party assets. Uh, these are assets that um, the KMT scooped up after it reclaimed uh, Taiwan from the Japanese in 1945 and should have gone into the national treasury but went into the party treasury. Next. And, uh, well, um, uh, the backlash of democracy. Democracy is not a cure-all, and some people have been disappointed in Taiwan. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Taiwan's a young democracy, and uh, its expectations of democracy are sometimes a little too high, and they don't realize the, that uh, democracy can't cure everything. Next. And I'll just suffice it to say here, the media has also contributed to this backlash of democracy through its exaggeration, its overreach, and its lack of professionalism. Next. So what's the conclusion then? Turquoiseation. I introduced the concept uh, somewhat earlier. Uh, this is the bringing together of the blue and gold. Uh, the blue and the green, excuse me. Uh, people in the Tsai Ing-wen administration, yes, this is a green administration, but there's also folks in this administration that have deep blue roots. Tsai Ing-wen really needs to more clearly define and push forward her Taiwan consensus. To me, it's to create a new direction and a newly crafted common point of view in both cross-strait relations and Taiwan affairs. Once she does that, she will have fulfilled her campaign promise to bring polarization under control. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, and please join me again next week at same time, same place, when my guest will be retired Taiwan Admiral Lawrence Dunn, who served as defense attache in Washington. See you then.